Good, well, good morning and welcome. <laughs> it's one of those days, right? Uh, glad to have you here for worship, our second Sunday of Advent. Draw your attention to the announcements that are on the uh, half sheets there in your bulletin. Um, just to highlight, uh, you probably noticed that giving, uh, 22 giving envelopes are out there, so uh, grab those as you're leaving if you haven't already. Uh, the Christmas program is next Sunday, so that will be a part of our regular worship here on Sunday morning. Uh, with that, then the base sale you can see at the bottom, so just read through that, and our proceeds will go to the uh, global barnyard, as you can see there. On the back side note, the giving tree, you can see the options that are before you on that, as well as then the uh, blue sheet with the poinsettias uh, and ability to uh, in honor of or in memory of other people uh, donate there. Are there other announcements or prayer concerns this morning? 
If not, let's join together, stand and join together in our confession and forgiveness on page one of your bulletin. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who alone does wonders, who lifts up the lowly, who fills the hungry with good things. Amen. Let us confess our sin, trusting in the tender mercy of our God. God, for whom we wait in the presence of one another, we confess our sin before you. We fail in believing that your good news is for us. We falter in our call to tend to your creation. We <clears throat> our sense of self and material wealth. We fear those different from ourselves. We forget that we are your children and turn away from your love. Forgive us, blessed one, and assure us again of your saving grace. Amen. God in Christ Jesus has looked with favor upon you. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, your sins are forgiven. You are children of the Most High, inheritors of the eternal promise, and recipients of divine mercy. God strengthens you anew to follow the way of peace. Amen. We join the hymn of Come, O Come, Emmanuel, 257, verses 1, 5, and 7. 1, 5, and 7.
We praise you, O oh God, for these lights that mark our days of preparation for Christ's advent. As we light these candles, kindle within us the fire of your Spirit, that we may be light shining in the darkness. Enlighten us with your grace, that we may welcome others as you have welcomed us. Amen. You may be seated as we sing our Advent hymn. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. 
When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne in his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will punish him with a rod such as mortals use, with blows inflicted by human beings. But I will not take my steadfast love from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Word of God, word of life. Amen. Psalm this morning is Psalm 66, verses 1 through 12, and we'll read uh, responsibly, you may read the bold. Make a joyful noise to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give his name glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. Because of your great power, your enemies cringe before you. All the earth worships you. They sing praises to you. Sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds among mortals. He turned the sea into dry land. He passed through the river on the foot. And the river rejoiced in him. Who rules by his might forever. Whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let the rebellious not exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. Who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is dry. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let the people ride over our heads. We went into the fire and into the water. Yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from Paul's letter to the Philippians, uh, chapter 1, 3 through 11. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I'm confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you <clears throat> will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you, <clears throat> because you hold me in your heart, for all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness. How I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ, you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, God. Well, good Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. The Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin, engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High 
will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for who, her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated, and before I start here, just a, I met one announcement, and that is a great thank you to all those who stayed after the worship last week and uh, helped with the decorations. It's always uh, a, a fun uh, transformation, and since we didn't really get to have that last year, it's even more special in many ways. So again, thank you for all who were able to help with that. It looks wonderful. Um, we're continuing this walk through the first chapter of Luke, and the second story is what we, uh, what is called the Annunciation to Mary, or in other traditions, it's also called the Annunciation to the Blessed Virgin Mary, or the Annunciation to Our Lady, or the Annunciation of the Lord. We, in the Protestant <laughs> traditions, <laughs> We have a kind of a difficult time knowing how to deal with Mary, don't we? In some ways, I mean, part of that is because in some ways, to some people, Mary has been almost lifted up to the level of, of God, of a deity. She, in many people's eyes, kind of have equal footing with the Holy Spirit and even with Jesus himself. Kind of instead of a trinity, it's a quadrinity uh, in some people's minds. And so that kind of freaks some of us out, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, it's, it's a little uncomfortable. And our reaction to that sometimes is that we've tended to ignore Mary's role kind of altogether in a way. We've ignored it and just kind of put it to the side. Her, her part in the salvation history story just isn't as clear as it really is. I mean, think about it. We have churches all over the country that are named St. Andrews, St. Mark, St. Stephen's, and others, right? I don't know of any Lutheran churches that are St. Mary's. I think there are some. I think I, I looked at one. I was trying to look them up, and I think in Kenosha, Wisconsin, there's a St. Mary's Lutheran church. I don't know which tradition it is, but I, I've never experienced one. I've never run across one, and I've been to a lot of churches throughout the country. Um, part of the problem is is that we have that bias from our our time gone by, right? I mean, we we don't want to be like the Catholics. <laughs> I hate to say it that way, but that's our bias, isn't it? Um, and yet, at the same time, Mary plays an important role in the salvation story. In fact, she probably plays a more prominent role than even some of those others that I mentioned, Andrew and Mark and. Stephen and others, right? I mean, her role is pretty significant. But the problem is, we only hear about Mary, or the, the significance of her really, in Luke's Gospel. He is the only one who really lifts her up as a, as a model of Christian discipleship, of Christian faith. And we'll see that more fully as we walk through this text, and a little bit more in the next week as we hear her sing about her role in this whole uh, drama, and how she will bear the child Jesus. So let's look at what we have before us today. I think you'll discover, maybe as you were hearing me read it, you'll you recognize, wow, there's a lot in here. <laughs> way too much, there's way too many sermons about things that he could go off on, and that's absolutely true. But let me focus on a, a couple of things that I at least strike me. First of all, we hear at the beginning of the text that it's the sixth month when the angel Gabriel was sent by God to Nazareth. Now the timing of the sixth month simply refers to as the text then later describes is that it's now six months since Elizabeth was told that she's going to have a child, right? So we've got that timeline going. Elizabeth is six months along in her pregnancy with John, eventually John the Baptist. 
And then there's Gabriel. I can't say that I know a whole lot about Gabriel. He shows up here in John, uh, Luke's Gospel at the announcement that John is going to be born and here the announcement to Mary that Jesus will be born. He does show up. Uh, Gabriel shows up in the book of Daniel and he's referenced, not by name, but uh, in, in the book of Ezekiel as well. But I'm really drawn more to what we hear next. You see, I, I believe Luke is very intentional about naming uh, the place that it is. And where is it that Gabriel comes to? Nazareth, right? Not Jerusalem, which would be more understandable, but why Nazareth? I mean, if, to jump Gospels for a second, remember in John's Gospel when Philip is trying to convince Nat Nathaniel that he should come and follow this Jesus that Philip has discovered, that has, has called him to be a disciple. And when he tells Nathaniel about it, or when Philip tells Nathaniel about it, what does Nathaniel say? Because he's, he's telling him this, this Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph, is amazing. And, and Nathaniel looks at him and says, Nazareth, what good can come out of Nazareth? Remember that story? So Nazareth, Nazareth, we hear, and I think Luke is highlighting this, is this out of the way, no, of no significance place. There is one bit of significance, and that is that Joseph is there. <laughs> and Joseph is a distant relative of King David. Hence the connection with the Samuel story, right? Because not only is Solomon going to build a physical temple, but what the prophet was telling David was, I'm not going to let you build a house for me, but you, your descendants are going to be the house. And eventually your kingdom will reign forever through your descendants. And here that is coming to fruition. And then there's Mary. She's also there. She's more than likely, and I don't know if you process this, but more than likely she was a teenage girl, probably 13 or 14 at the most. It's uncomfortable for some people to think about. <laughs> and yes, she was engaged to Joseph, but on her own, I mean, she wasn't very significant. As I joke, I had a German short hair pointer once that had a better pedigree than Mary. Don't mean to be offensive, but that, I mean, in many ways, that's true. And yet, how does the angel Gabriel address her? Greetings, favored one. It's the same word that Elizabeth uses for herself when she is told that she is going to bear John, that she is a favored one. And after a little moment of freaking out, Mary is told again that don't be afraid you have found favor with God I think the question is why why does God choose Mary to be the mother of our Lord and why Nazareth was she particularly faithful was she brilliant was she beautiful we really don't know but it's out of that nothingness, out of not knowing much about Mary, and out of the insignificance of Nazareth, that's what speaks to me. You see, Mary isn't blessed or graced or favored because she's special. Mary is special because she has been blessed and graced and favored by God. In our Lutheran tradition, we call that election. God elected or chose Mary. Not by anything that she had done, but simply God choosing to do so. And that speaks to me. And I hope it speaks to you as well. Because if we're honest, I think many of us look at God and think, God isn't, doesn't act that way anymore, right? 
I mean, it's, in our everyday lives, do we really expect to see God at work in the world around us? I mean, we, we have, I think, in, in our minds, for many of us at least, some of you not maybe, but kind of a more passive role to see God at work, that God is, you know, hanging around in the background, waiting, watching, being supportive and encouraging. Maybe some of you are hearing the same song and that goes through my mind. Remember that Midler song, the refrain to that? God is watching us, God is watching us, God is watching us where? In the distance. I've always hated that song. Because <laughs> God doesn't watch us from a distance. God is right here with us all the time. I mean, the biblical description of God is that God not only watches over us, but God gets directly involved with us. God does things, all kinds of things, miraculous things, mighty things, and yet also small things, mundane things. But God is constantly at work and still is. But it's hard for us to believe and see it. So part of what hits me in this text is in, that in some ways, I hope that we can see that we're all like Mary. To remember that just as Jesus was implanted in Mary, God has come to us as well and implanted Jesus in our hearts and in our minds. And not because you're special, and not because you're super faithful, and certainly not because you're brilliant or beautiful. Just kidding. Just seeing if you're still awake at this point. <laughs> All right, sorry. It took a little while, so you're not quite ready with me. Maybe it's the mask you can't hear as well. Anyway. But I want you to hear. And, and it, it was in the confession, the announcement, the, the proclamation of forgiveness in the, in the confession we heard today. But God has elected you. You are God's favored ones. The Lord is with you. God has simply chosen to bless you and grace you and bring you the presence of God's Son into your life. I hope you get chills over that. But of course the next question is, so okay, what do we do with it? <laughs> How do we respond to that? Well, let's look at Mary's response. Well, her response was just about like every other person in the scriptures that God comes to in a similar way. Moses, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and such. Their first response is, what? Who? Me? You gotta be kidding, right? I mean, that's kind of Mary's response. She didn't quite say it that way, but it says she was perplexed and that she pondered. The word pondered isn't as good as she started debating with Gabriel how this can be. She was trying to get a handle on what he was telling her. And further, she questions how, how can God do what's impossible? Right? And I know that's where I struggle. I question how God can do some of the impossible things that we need to have done in our world today, huh? I just can't imagine how also God can use me to make a, a real difference in this world. The issues sometimes are just too great. I mean, I, I want things to change. I want this pandemic <laughs> to go away. I want to figure out how public education can really serve the youth of our communities and the families. I mean, another shooting this week, you gotta be kidding me. And I listen to my daughter struggle in the classroom. It's horrific. And I want quality health care. And not just for those who can afford it, but for everyone. I want our politicians to really care and make a difference, not for those who support them or give them money or whatever, but for everyone. That their call is for the common good of all. 
And not just us, but for our, everyone in the world as well. I want racism and sexism and all the other things like that to go away. And it's overwhelming, isn't it? I, like a lot of people, I, I, we're overwhelmed by those needs. And we just can't see how God is working in the midst of it all. <laughs> and yet, and yet once more, God is calling out to you to me and to the world around us. God keeps reminding us that God is still active in this world. That God is active in our lives. That God is telling us that nothing is impossible. And I need to hear that. I need to be reminded of that over and over again. It not only gives me hope, as I hope it does for you, but it nudges me it nudges me closer to responding as Mary did. Her response was, after watching all those football games yesterday, put me in, coach, right? That's her response. Put me in. Here am I, the servant of the Lord. She says, let it be with me according to your word. Oh, I wish it was easier for me to respond like that. I wish I could submit to God's will and way Today, I want you to hear God speaking to you again, just as God spoke to Mary. That God is saying to you, greetings, favored ones. The Lord is with you and intends to do great things through you. And it's okay to respond like Mary with doubts and questions and wonders. How can this be? We're just ordinary, everyday people. But in the midst, I'll also hear God speak. That even so, you have found favor with God. That the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will guide you and work through you to care for this world and the people that God loves so much. That truly, nothing is impossible with God. And ultimately, I, I hope that together we can respond joyously. Here am I. Here am I, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word.
Please stand as we join together in confessing and professing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together we confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. In the season of watching and waiting, let us pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. Let us pray. Lord, you send messengers into the world to proclaim the day of your coming. Make our bishops, pastors, deacons, and lay preachers confident in their preaching that their words and our lives witness to your grace. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Send your spirit to all living creatures that are in danger. Provide them with shelter and care, and bring us into right relationship with the earth that you might cre that you create and call good. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Send leaders to our nation, cities, schools, and businesses to work on behalf of those who have lost parents, spouses, and loved ones to immigrants, the imprisoned, those living in poverty, and all who are oppressed. Make them bold in their commitments to justice and reconciliation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Send your servants to care for those who suffer. Use our ministries and our lives to reach out with compassion to those who are hungry, oppressed, lonely, or ill. We pray especially today for those on our prayer list, as well as others that we, in, that we know to be in need, as we name them now before you in the silence of our hearts. Grant them, Lord, your healing and wholeness. Hear us, O God. Send prophets to speak difficult truths, even when they are poorly received. Embolden those who ask hard questions and challenge accepted ways. Instill in youth and elders alike a passion for pointing to Jesus in all things. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We remember your saints, both those publicly celebrated and those more humbly remembered. Confident that your work will be completed, we live in faith until the day of your coming. Hear us, O God. Hear your mercy is great. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers and those of our hearts in the name of Jesus. join again in prayer. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth. In mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord from the living faith, as he comes to us in his Holy Son. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take me, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. And God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. This is the table of the Lord, and all are welcome to it. 
You may be seated, and we're going to share the elements uh, together. So if you can struggle to get that wafer up. It seems to be getting harder every week. I don't know. Um, but we'll share the wafer together, and then, uh, and again, if it takes you a little bit, and if you don't match with everybody else, don't worry about it. God is still present in these times. Christ is with you. So together, let us eat this bread which is given for you. And we share in this cup the love Christ shed for you. Please stand and receive the blessing. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Most high God, you have come among us at this table. By the Spirit's power, form us to be bearers of your word, sharing gifts of mercy and grace with all. Christ Jesus, our host and our guest. The God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that we may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Through Christ Jesus, for whom we wait. Amen. We join in our closing hymn, Joy of the World, hymn 267. 267.
Thanks be to God. Thank you.